Nines, Paul Bloom with the latest. Paul, good to see you. Uh, give us your take. Uh, I know you've been watching this so closely. Uh, Kim yeah. Potter taking the stand today. What are your first thoughts? Yeah, it's a lot to unpack. Uh, it was an intense uh, almost two hours. She's on the witness stand uh, under direct examination. You heard it there. Earl Gray, her defense attorney, walking her through uh, uh, the case and biographical information. And then up until uh, the traffic stop shooting, uh, intense, uh, clearly emotional. Uh, there were some parts there uh, as we get in and around the shooting itself and the aftermath. Uh, her memory seems uh, to have failed her. There are just some spots uh, she cannot fill in. Uh, I thought her uh, emotion was, was very heartfelt, uh, very genuine. Uh, obviously a, a shattered woman, a shattered former police officer, uh, given what happened. But uh, as to where the jury falls on it, you know, we, we just don't know. I, I will note that we looked over the pool notes from reporters who were in the courtroom. Uh, jurors are wearing masks. Uh, I'll point that out during the pandemic. So always hard to read emotion, but, but no reports of any sort of jurors, uh, you know, getting uncomfortable or feeling, mm -hmm. you know, awkward. The, the very, very minimal reaction from jurors is kind of how our, our pool reporters describing uh, reaction uh, on that side of the courtroom. And of course, really, that's all that matters is how it's processed there. I talked to people in the newsroom, friends, lawyers who watched it today, and there were some real mixed emotions about it. Depends, uh, you know, how, what side you're coming from, I think. Uh, was it an innocent mistake, innocent accident, heat of the moment, or, or was it... Uh, was it uh, culpable negligence? Was it recklessness? Was this a cop that, that failed in their one moment in their career? They train all their lives uh, to make sure this doesn't happen. And then on that day, uh, it happened. So I, I think there was something on, on both sides to take away from it, but uh, certainly compelling. And, uh, and I know you, you're going to continue playing the, other, the rest of it after you speak with me, but uh, uh, certainly worth a watch and kind of consuming it. Uh, because uh, between the direct examination and the cross-exam, uh, it was intense. Yeah, Paul, and of course, uh, the defense calling it just a tragic mistake. One of the points that they really uh, focused in on today was the fact that Potter, uh, in her you know, 26 years as a police officer, had never, ever fired the taser uh, when it was on her person. She never you know, pr was presented the opportunity uh, to do that. So what did you make of that? I thought that was interesting. No, certainly interesting. Never had deployed her taser, never had shot her weapon uh, right. in real life, as how Earl Gray described it. So, no, that was a uh, new, I mean, Pitt pulled both weapons. Uh, you know, she, she acknowledged training on, on both. Uh, you know, an effective moment of cross-examination. Uh, the prosecution, Aaron Eldridge, uh, assistant uh, attorney general here in Minnesota, put the two photos of the weapons side by side on the screen. I, I would imagine for a jury to see that side by side and One's yellow, right? One's black. One's, you know, heavier than the other. You know, they're asking questions and sort of seeing the visual, visible, you know, difference between the two weapons. I, I thought was sort of a powerful, you know, moment to create for the prosecution. And and how do you uh, mix it up? And and you know, it, it just sort of again, the, the overwhelming emotion. It was hard at times. She. Uh, uh, physical reaction I saw right before the lunch break when kind of her uh, defense attorneys jumped in and said let's let's take a break here they were playing uh, the footage the body camera footage when she yells taser 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 uh, and is about to, to mm -hmm. fire you know again she thinks it's the taser but it's the gun um, I mean she was physically upset and, and uh, uh, that's when they grabbed their lunch break but uh, yeah it was uh, it was quite a quite a scene uh, on that witness stand today yeah, and Paul, just a few more moments, too, I just want to point out. We really got a sense of, you know, who Kim Potter uh, as a human was, you know, why she wanted to be a police officer, uh, kind of getting uh, a sense of, of her background and also uh, the, the history of her as a police officer as well. Were there any, you know, abuse or misconduct claims in her record as a Brooklyn Center officer? Well, that's what's interesting. No, right? In these mm -hmm. other police cases, typically there are backgrounds of complaints and you worry about putting uh, your officer on the stand because then all of a sudden the personnel file flies wide open and, and, and they have to address these issues. But for Potter, no, she's 26 years, uh, well liked by her fellow officers. Uh, I think I read in one bi biography of her uh, leading up to trial, I think the one complaint uh, or, 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 or nicks, uh, you know, against her record was at one point she was supposed to be mo monitoring, you know, like a traffic intersection. And she wrote some notes about the squirrels she was watching over 
in the, uh, huh. the the neighboring trees. But no, so a clean record. Someone who wanted to be a police officer her whole basically her whole life, right? She talked about uh, how an officer came to her grade school and she was committed that she saw that police did good and, and she wanted to be that. Uh, so no, the getting in that biographical stuff important. Certainly, the state didn't attack her on that. It was it's more the training and then sort of acknowledging that she had. 25 plus years of of training of being told not to mistake her weapon of how to draw each weapon of you know how to de-escalate situations so uh that that is there too and the other thing i really thought extremely interesting was the idea that had she been alone that day she probably doesn't even make that traffic stop the fact that her rookie she was training somebody she was sort of the the secondary training cop there and and, and they want their their trainees to have public uh, interactions and public uh, uh, encounters, if you will. Um, so she allowed sort of the stop to unfold, mm -hmm. but uh, she said uh, given the circumstances and the expired license tabs and, and the, the air freshener hanging, if she were alone that day, she wouldn't probably bother to stop that vehicle with Dante Wright. Paul, last, last point I want to make, because um, we also got a sense uh, of the, I guess, criminal history uh, that Dante Wright had. Remember, uh, there was a warrant out for some type of weapons violation. Uh, what did we learn on that front, and, and why was that relevant? Well, it's interesting, because obviously that gets into the totality of the circumstances. Uh, more of, of Dante Wright's record did not come in. Uh, it was... It was talked about in court yesterday outside of the eyes and ears of the, the jury. The jury went home. So, so they didn't hear about necessarily him fleeing police in the past or some of his other arrests. But the important part of this situation as in terms of uh, uh, Kimberly Potter's state of mind and, and then eventually obviously her, her, her innocence or guilt here uh, was what she knew as she walked up to that car. So they had run his ID. Now, he didn't have a valid driver's license. His license was suspended. There was a warrant out for a prior weapons violation and there was this uh, temporary restraining order or order for protection it's been described several different ways but certainly a, a, a court document that, that would have kept him away from a, a specific woman but of course police in that moment don't know who that woman is and he's got a female passenger next to him so Potter's point is I've got a I've got a guy who has a, a, a warrant out for a prior weapons violation I've got an order for protection against a woman involving a woman and there's a woman in that car um, no no valid driver's license so all of a sudden after running his ID you know everything's kinda um, you know enhanced mm -hmm. uh, the, the the concern level and of course is he starts out fully complying but then all of a sudden he tries to break away uh, from the handcuffs and then dives back into the car and that's when Kimberly Potter described it all went chaotic. She used that term a couple times. It all went chaotic um, and, and the rest unfolded. I thought one other interesting point and, and you'll hear it uh, I think coming up uh, if you pick up the testimony where you stopped it today is what she perceives of Sergeant Johnson on the opposite side and the passenger on the passenger side of that compartment uh, he's inside. He's trying to hold on to Dante. He's trying to hold the gear shift from being pushed into drive, trying to hold back uh, Elena, the passenger next to Dante, and him sort of being stuck in that car. And she said she looked over and saw a fear she had never seen before. And that was sort of her last sort of thought before, again, pulling what she thought was her taser, but in the end ended up being the deadly firearm. All right, Fox 9's Paul Bloom, we appreciate you breaking that down for us. We'll speak to you again. You bet, Andrew. Have a great weekend. You too.